Hey, I call order uh, the joint meeting of the York County School Board and Board of Supervisors for March 35th. I don't know, uh, Mark, if you need to, what do you want to do? I'll just officially board? say I'll call to order the York County School Board to our joint session with the Board of Supervisors this evening. So and okay. thanks for another joint meeting. Great. Roll call, please. Mr. Zaremba. Here. Mrs. Knoll. Here. Mr. Wiggins. Here. Mr. Reshack. Here. Mr. Shepard. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Great. Okay, so uh, this is, I believe, what, the second? Or third? third? Okay, the time flies when you're having fun. And uh, this is really great. We've had uh, some really good interaction. And tonight, now, you've already approved your budget. And as this is the routine we've gone through, and we haven't gotten to our budget yet. So um, tonight we'll be addressing several, uh, uh, several items that are all related to that. After we finish this meeting, the Board of Supervisors then will go into a regular work session for continuation of our budget discussion. In the meantime, I will turn it over to Mark Carter. And Thank you. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we'd like to start off tonight with a continuation of the discussion that we had at the last meeting where Mr. Cross presented some information about the uh, population projections and school enrollment projections. Um, since that time, our staffs have continued to work together. Tim, Tim Cross and Dr. James and others have uh, talked about the enrollment picture as well as the, uh, the situation with the proposed new elementary school. And tonight, Tim is going to present to you the results of that discussion, uh, which, which is an agreement by the two staffs in terms of the timing for that proposed school. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Tim. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Chairman Shepard, Chairman Medford, members of the two boards. Back in December, we came before you all to talk about future housing development. Can you go ahead and put the first slide up there, Mark? And uh, future housing development in the Magruder and Yorktown Elementary School attendance zones and what it pretends for school enrollment and the need for a new elementary school, which the school board has been including in its CIP request for the past uh, several years. Following the two boards' direction, county and school division staff have worked together over the past several months to come up with a plan and a timetable, a uh, mutually agreeable timetable for building a new school. I've appreciated the opportunity to work with Dr. James, Mark Shearhart, and James Lash at the school division. And I know we're all grateful to the elementary school principals, uh, Jane Koryatsik at Magruder, and uh, principals and assistant principals, Jane Koryatsik at Magruder, Robert Knowles at Yorktown, uh, Christina Head at Seaford, and Jennifer Goodwin at Waller Mill, who took time out of their bus busy schedules to uh, show us around their respective schools and uh, so we could see firsthand some of the uh, spacing uh, capacity issues that they deal with on a daily basis. The result of our combined efforts is reflected in the proposed CIP, uh, which programs or proposes funding in FY 2017 for design and construction of a new elementary school to be open in time for the 2019-2020 school year. This recommendation is based on the following findings and assumptions. Next slide. Uh, there are fi over 1,500 approved future housing units in the Magruder and Yorktown attendance zones, and they will be funneling uh, students into the system. A lot of this growth will be triggered, <coughs> fueled by the Marine Corps Security Force Regiment Consolidation and Naval Weapons Station. Uh, which is going to occur in several phases uh, beginning August 2015 through 2018 and is expected to bring over 300 households to the area and over 300 uh, dependents under the age of 21. Obviously not all of them are going to live in York County, but we are assuming that a good proportion <coughs> of them are. Uh, in addition, resident births, as always, and resales of existing homes are expected to continue to contribute to school enrollment growth. Next slide, please. And uh, altogether, we uh, project that up to 200 additional students will be added in the Magruder and Yorktown attendance zones in the next five years. Unfortunately, both schools are currently operating at or near their maximum capacity today. And the two adjacent elementary schools, Waller Mill to the north and Seaford to the south, do not have enough capacity to handle the additional students. Next slide, please. The, uh, the comprehensive plan says that when we're addressing school overcrowding, we look first at shifting the attendance zones. <clears throat> then we looked at port look at portable classrooms if it's a temporary situation. Beyond that, we look at adding classrooms 
or if we're facing a long-term crowding situation where the capacity deficit is projected to exceed the minimum capacity level at that grade level for an extended period, we need to look at new construction. And this is the situation that we're facing in the Magruder Yorktown area. Hence, the proposed uh, CIP project, $23 million in FY 2017 for design and construction of a new elementary school to open in September 2019. Uh, excuse me. <coughs> You may recall the school board's original proposal was to fund the design work in FY 2016 and with the construction work in FY 2017. But we discussed it. We decided that it would make sense to fund it all in FY 2017, which postpones the decision point at which the school board will, would need to choose between the two school sites that are under consideration. As you know, uh, Yorktown Middle School campus is one site, and then the proffered uh, six-and-a-half-acre uh, school site at the marquee is the other one and uh, those two sites are currently being evaluated for their potential uh, for a school uh, building next slide please the uh, looking at it pictorially graphically uh, this is the situation as it exists currently at the two elementary schools the burgundy bars represent capacity and the gold bars represent enrollment as the chart shows, both schools are basically operating at capacity today. Uh, next slide, please. By 2019, we project Magruder will be about 80 students over capacity, and Yorktown will be more than 100 students over capacity. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Building a 500 student school as proposed in the CIP would allow 350 students to be shifted out of Magruder and Yorktown addressing the space deficiencies in both schools while allowing additional space at all three schools for future enrollment growth. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the <clears throat> a general picture of the situation as we projected in 2019 with the new school, assuming that we shifted uh, about 350 students to the new school. Um, and <clears throat> for Magruder and York, it's going to depend on, on how you draw the attendance zones, what the actual impact is going to be at Magruder and Yorktown. For our purposes tonight, we just divided it evenly and showed them uh, both at what would be the average enrollment, which is 584 students. Uh, we use 350 students as a target because the school board's guideline for the elementary school for elementary school size is 350 to 700 students. So you could put more than 350 students in the new school initially. Uh, you just could not have fewer than 350. should also be noted that the core facilities for the school, such as cafeteria and the gymnasium, would be designed for the maximum future capacity of 700 students, even though uh, what they're proposing right now, uh, what's being proposed is would be a 500 student school. Uh, but with the core facilities designed for 700, so that if the school needs to be expanded sometime in the future, you already have the uh, core facilities in place to accommodate it. Situation that comes up sometimes with these older, smaller schools, you go in to add classrooms, but unfortunately the cafeteria is still built for the smaller size, so you're gonna be having to stagger the lunch hours uh, so much that you know lunch runs from about 10.30 to 1.30 and takes up you know, most of the school day. Uh, so you avoid that problem if you design the core facilities for the maximum capacity at the beginning. Uh, the other thing to note is that designing the new school does not commit you to building it right away. Uh, the plans can sit on the shelf for a few years at least. If it turns out that the marine consolidation uh, falls behind schedule for, or enrollment falls below our projections for some reason, uh, so you do have some flexibility there in uh, the schedule. And uh, next year when you all are talking about the budget and the CIP, uh, you'll have another year's worth of data on which to decide if it still makes sense to target uh, September 2019 for the opening of the new school. And uh, you can move to the next slide. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions you might have. Yeah, this is a question. Don? Uh, Tim, did you tour the, uh, the new uh, addition to Seaford Elementary? Yes, we did. How many more? I did too. That's a wonderful new addition. It is. It's very nice. How many, um, how many students? Well, I believe it was uh, six there? classrooms. Uh, six classrooms. Six classrooms. So uh, depending on what grades, you know, it would be 20 to 25 students per classroom. So somewhere between 120 and 
Were they overcrowded before that? They were crowded. Uh, I don't know. Don't know if they were overcrowded, but I was just wondering if any if any more students were were, were able to shift to that school. Well, I do know that uh, that uh, the the pre K students in, who are zoned for Seaford, I believe, are currently at Dare Elementary still. Uh, so I guess there's a, an opportunity there to maybe shift them back to Seaford where they're supposed to be. Uh, currently, Seaford is operating above its, uh, I mean, it's has excess <laughs> capacity in terms of its instructional capacity. Uh, it has more capacity than enrollment. Okay. Ms. Knowles, do you have a question? I saw you, that you were- Did you get a cup of coffee, thank you. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Twenty-three million dollars um, uh, seems rather low for a cost of a new school, and the reason I say that is because I've been monitoring James City County's school growth over the last five, six, seven, eight years, and it seems to me their their school costs are a heck of a lot more than twenty-three million bucks. Uh, how accurate are those, those numbers? Well, uh, it's not really. You know, we didn't get in. We started out with with 23 million, uh, which was the proposal from the school board. But I do know that historically, for whatever reason, James City County's school construction costs have typically been higher than we've had in York County. Uh, I don't know what the reason for that would be. Uh, maybe one of the school board representatives could could tell you that. Uh, the uh, right now, our you said our average student population per class is 25. Is that accurate? Well, it's tw uh, 20. Uh, 20 in the lower grades and 25 in the upper grades in the elementary schools. Elementary school. so pretty, 20, you're, sticking, you're able to stick to 20, only 20? K2 is 20 and 3.5 is 25. 3.5 is 25. That's been our goal. So it's, and yeah, I know for years we've talked about, board. you know, the goals, max goals and so on. Uh, are, we, are we still at our goal or below our goal or are we, are we blowing through the the goal roof, so to speak. Uh, no, I think to, to credit this school board and, and, and you all, we've, we've managed to stay at our average, I think, is right around 19 for a K-2 and right under you know, 24, 23 to 24 for 3-5. Um, but, but that's the average, so we do have some classes that may have 28 students in the class. In the lower grades, too? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, how many classrooms is this proposed school? Uh, well, Passage 500, number of classrooms that we have that number. Yeah, we don't, we don't have that number. Which automatically, if I recall correctly, at least two classes for each grade, maybe more, for comparison's sake. Probably three, but at least no more, no less than two. Three to four. Three to four, yeah. they're saying. Right. Yeah. Three to four what? Three to four Classes per grade per level. Grade. So three or four kindergartens, three or four first grades. Is that new school? Et cetera. That's when school, you design a new school, right. that's what you would like. Yeah. Like you have. Any other questions, Walt? I think it Not depends right on the school. Okay. Depends George, on the school. So we'll just to kind of follow on with what Walt's getting at. Building this, this new elementary <clears throat> school and drawing down the other two, would there be opportunity or reason to draw down some of the other uh, elementary schools kind of balance everything out with the, the classrooms uh, in all of them or are just going to stick to those three well, I think schools? you well, I think I how that works with what chiming in for the zones for our the feeder schools for our high schools um, sometimes we're limited on where the boundaries can be moved because otherwise we end up with splits which we actually have some splits that deal with some students going to Grafton other students going to a different high school um, so we got to be careful when we start moving boundaries and such, but um, we look at all options and we'll ask, you know, when we get to that <coughs> point, but we don't want to split things so crazy that it doesn't make any sense within the county. And that committee meet every other year, regardless, evaluating enrollment and boundaries, and I think it's pretty much every other year, if I'm not mistaken. Carl? I have to ask Carl. That's all right. That's yes or no. Thank you. What we typically do, Dr. Joyce, is monitor enrollment throughout the school year and see where we look at potential growth in a school and then balance accordingly. Over the past years, we have, say, the Neville Weapon Station. All of those students were zoned for Magruder. We looked at the numbers and made a decision to basically divide the Naval Weapon Station in half along Naval Lebanon Church Road 
and now we have almost equal number of students going to Magruder Elementary and Yorktown Elementary from the Naval Weapons Station. Mm -hmm. So this would require some attendance zone adjustments mm -hmm. because we know we're facing capacity issues at Yorktown Elementary and also at Magruder. Okay. Um, just uh, real quick to kind of sum summarize this. So we're looking at uh, FY17 budget where we would uh, put in about $23 million roughly. And then from that, uh, the first uh, year or so is the engineering piece. And then we go to a, anyway, we build up to an F, uh, FY19 opening. That'll be the grand opening and parents and everybody will be notified of uh, of the attendance at the, the various schools as you shift students around. So that will all handle, handle through you guys. But the, but the planning and everything will be in the, starting with the FY, FY17. That's the funding piece. So there shouldn't be any surprises coming through with that. Correct. And uh, um, I noticed on your school numbers, which you've been fairly accurate uh, over the years, that it was like almost 30, <laughs> like 30, I mean, this one time, I know, well, we'll there's other issues there, but um, there was only like 30 student difference, so we've been pretty close to the capacity. Um, I don't know how much delay, in, uh, unless something would really significantly reduce the numbers, because I could see a hiccup where that they would pile back in pretty quickly, and we, we don't want to get caught behind. Uh, having to put uh, students in trailers and things like that has never been uh, a fun thing so and one question too and I guess this might be a county staff question but let's say that the growth sped up I mean to where we're seeing major enrollment issues where we're now you know having to move in mobile classroom units uh, trailers to put kids in trying to find places to put them um, once this project's approved and placed on the CIP, you mentioned that it can be pushed outward, but can it be pulled closer if we needed to? Well, I mean, it's a we'll, planning we'll, tool. We'll have to right. see, yeah, you know, and we'll have to see how things work out. We'll, I mean, we FY17, you know, right. right? We're 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 into the, you know, we're going into the 16, 16, 17 budget. So uh, that'll be things that the staff will and we will expect to hear from you routinely so we'll there won't be any big surprises one of the things um, that, um, that we've been very aware of although we saw the number of the new homes and the number of students the growth in this county is, is well under one percent I mean it's just about 0.6 and that's very manageable relatively speaking and so doing these sort of things kind of helps you know it's necessary and helps us plan for that so Okay, uh, if there, you got another question? Okay. The 23 uh, million is, is bricks and mortar. Now, <clears throat> have you done any calculations in terms of the added operational costs with respect to uh, teachers. The teachers and support, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, yeah, we have, uh, Mr. Zoramo, done some preliminary looks at that, and it, it looks like the range could be between a million to $1.3 million, depending on how many teachers we have to add on. Some teachers would shift from their existing schools, but then there would be some additional staff added to, and that, that's so we don't know exactly how many teachers we'd be added on. But you're going to have the core responsibility of staff, like mm -hmm. you're going to have to have a principal, you're going to have to have a librarian, mm -hmm. you're going to have to have an assistant principal, nurse, those kinds of folks are going to come with this building because you have to have them in the building you're going to have the Virginia the the electricity cost the utility costs that go along with the building Dennis just as an example you know how much it costs you to run <coughs> a school I think that would be helpful to us to know We've how much that. it would cost. Yeah, it's, 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 cool. a, it's a, in the neighborhood of a million to a million and two depending on the size a million of the to school. million two is is the cost to and start that's, up a that's school that's just the that's, operating cost that's not right, the but that's for teachers and that's for equipment and that's yes and i'm sure that varies by level yeah it relative. does it right. does it's hard it's hard to say you can pick sure. one school and say it's going to be exactly like that right. what we try to do is we try to look at what are the additional new costs we're going to have to bring forth when we bring this building online oh, and yes. there's an assumption that the equipment is going to be new so the replacement of that will not have to take place in the current years yes. you know at least the next right. three to four years but after that then you got the replacement cost of the equipment the maintenance cost of the building goes up but your 23 million covers bricks and mortar period not the outfitting no, it does not cover the operating that's costs. right 
right. That's or, not or the outfitting of the school. That's or well. Does it include yeah, it the outfitting? Furniture would be included, but okay. some of the supplies and things would not be included in that. You're exactly right. Uh, okay. <clears throat> what about computers and things of that nature? Well, that, uh, is that that, all right that now, the estimate the does cost. include some some computers. Yes. It does. Right. But, the wiring and all that's good yeah. stuff. You know, two years from now, when we actually start looking at this building, we, it was pointed out earlier: the twenty-three million dollars is the twenty-three million going to be enough? We look at that every year. So next year when we look at the CIP, <clears throat> we'll take another look at that and see is it still a reasonable number or do we now have to bump it up? Because as you well know, construction costs go up every year as well. I believe, if I remember correctly, Mr. Cross can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this, when we first put this elementary school in the CIP six, seven years ago, we put it in like $15, 16000000 million. So it's grown mm -hmm. over time to where it is today. It has. Well, obviously we'll, as we we get closer to it we'll get better we'll get better figures and and it, the board will be very interested in hearing because that's a you know a school buying a school is kind of expensive so. okay um uh, is there any other questions that point then tim thank you very much for your presentation and mark what's next okay uh if you could give me a second here to bring up another Uh, what we want to do next is to move into a discussion of the entire uh, school CIP for uh, fiscal year 2016. And as you recall from my budget presentation to the Board of Supervisors um, two weeks ago, I guess it was, uh, we had proposed for fiscal year 16 a roll-up of the school's projects that totaled $8.2 million, and you see that in the third column, the projects that uh, had been recommended by the county uh, in terms of funding the various requests from the school division. Um, what we did to arrive at that proposed list of projects was to look at the, the total funding that had been approved in the current CIP for fiscal year 16. When, when the board adopted the budget last year, what was the fiscal year 2016 amount? And that was $8.89 million. Um, so we, we tried to develop a plan that would stay within that threshold of $8.8 .8 million. Um, and as a result, proposed that several of the school division's projects be shifted out to fiscal year 17. Um, we then, uh, after presentation of this proposal, <clears throat> pardon me, our, our two teams met, uh, the school division and county staff met, and Dr. Shander asked for an opportunity for his team to get together and, and uh, propose possibly some shifting around of those projects. Um, and what you see in the fourth column is the proposal that has been developed jointly, uh, which, which both of us support at this point in time, and that is to uh, advance uh, one of the projects that we had shifted to 17 back to fiscal year 16, uh, one that, that uh, Dr. Shander has indicated is a, is a particular priority, and that's the one second up from the bottom, the Bethel Manor renovation, 300 slash 400 halls, uh, which is a project that is estimated to cost $2.9 million. So shifting that from uh, 17 back into 16 requires that something be shed from 16 so that we can kind of balance and stay within that that target number so what's proposed you see there are four projects that we had originally proposed for 16 that are now proposed to move out to 17 that's the York High roof replacement phase one the um, kitchen equipment in five schools the re repainting of tab high and the tab elementary uh, metal roof phase one in addition, uh, it's proposed that Yorktown Elementary roof be split into two phases with 394,000 of that project being funded in 16 and the remaining 381 being funded in 17. So the, the net effect of that is to add $610,000 to my proposed CIP for, uh, column for fiscal year 16, bringing the total bottom line to $8.8 .8 million, which is what was approved in the current plan. Now, the other element of making this work is that um, we talked about how can that radio project, radio upgrade uh, for the various schools be funded. And what is proposed here is to draw $450,000 from the Impact Aid Revenue Stabilization Fund, 
which currently has a balance of five point four something million dollars. Five point six. Okay, pardon me, five point six. So drawing that four hundred and fifty thousand dollars down as a one-time expenditure still keeps that fund above the five million dollars. Um, and allows the radio project to be advanced so that it could be fully funded. Um, this is a project that would be managed cooperative, cooperatively by um, a team led by our, our radio expert, Terry Hall, uh, and then members of the school division staff. But anyway, that, that again was a priority that Dr. Shander felt very strongly about, and so we support uh, the proposal to, to, uh, that's been developed to advance that project. So. Uh, again, the fourth column here, the yellow highlighted column, represents uh, what we have arrived at in terms of a, of a joint uh, discussion to uh, fund the requests that are considered to be the most, uh, the highest priority by the school division, and um, we think it will it will work in terms of the number that was was adopted last year into the fiscal 16 CIP. And the picture that I saw of the Bethel. Uh, the school, I think, uh, Dr. Shander, you showed us. Uh, I think it might have been. Unfortunately, I think we may have seen them at dinner, and uh, which were they were pretty. Uh, um, the ones I saw were pretty amazing. That we that school had kind of. I mean, I don't know how you were holding the, holding it together there, but uh, um, yeah, that was that was pretty amazing to see the condition of that uh, of the school, and uh, so this is. I can see why that would be a priority to get that uh, renovation done. Now the other part too about, about the, sure if I can ask, are you talking about like what is the three hundred slash four hundred halls? Hall, what's halls? What's the word halls mean? It's it's part of the Bethel Manor Elementary School. That's the oldest. Just the halls. Just it's, the, no, it's the windows. It's the it's the it's the infrastructure. Carl, you want to give them the details on that? But it's a very old part of the building. Okay, you got you got a bathroom in there. It looks I mean it's just Horrible. everybody just looks terrible. So go ahead. Thank you. Um, as you may remember, some years ago we made an addition onto Beth Mount Elementary School. Yeah. But the 300 hall and 400 hall was the existing school that was built in the 1960s. That's the part that needs to be renovated, not the part that was built in the 2000s. It was it's just part of the school. Just part of the school, not the entire Designated school. Designated area, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, if you have those pictures, that would be great to pass those around. Anyway, get them, we can get the pictures over to the supervisors because there's nothing like an image there for an impact. Um, tied to that, uh, change is the um, the radios, the 800 megahertz radios. Now, uh, is that is the plan is to do all the high schools at once, or we're gonna, you're going to do them in phases? I think the goal of the plan, and, and I appreciate um, Mr. Carter's team working through that with us. Um, when I first arrived in September, that was brought to my attention in, in a meeting, and. Um, I can tell you nothing more important than safety for all for everyone in this room, and so that's certainly a, a priority for us. Um, the five hundred thousand um, dollars, I think. What's the gentleman's name again? Terry Hall. Mr. Well, Hall. I keep wanting to say Tim. Uh, Terry uh, is going to lead that project with us. So I think the, the first step to that is is assessing uh, all of the schools where we have have and don't have coverage. Um, and I've. Thank you for the public that's watching. Sure. Can you explain the situation? as to what you're talking referring to sure so in each of our schools we have 800 megahertz radios every we have um, our principals have those radios in the schools but we also have resource officers that have those and we also have our safety folks within the county that have those we have some some coverage issues in our schools where they can't get reception so um, one of our high schools in particular tab high school uh, ha has a larger gap in within the school where they don't have coverage for the it's radio. like down in the halls or down in correct the, and so correct. Large, there are large sections of the school where there's no you can't you can't communicate emergency response people cannot communicate with each other so you have to run up down the halls or get to a you know runner with a radio and try to get to a hot uh, spot where you can communicate right? right that's correct and i actually experienced that firsthand on a visit i was walking with one of our assistant principals and we had a teacher who um either collapsed or had had a medical situation and, and he and i were literally running through the hallway so he can get a signal to call for call for assistance so certainly that's a priority for, for everyone in this room and um, so I appreciate um, the flexibility with Mr. Carter's team. And I think that, again, this is another opportunity for our teams to work together uh, to make sure that we get this right. Great. Right. Questions? Walt? Yeah. Uh, to what extent does this system integrate with our existing uh, sheriff's department, fire and life safety? In other words, are we making sure that we have a unified 
system instead of pieces that work independently, like apparently we, we've got a problem now. Uh, and, and who, where is the uh, sort of the communication central, if you will, who's, who's making sure this the system, in fact, is a system that works? Uh, it, that? it will integrate completely, and Mr. Hall will ensure that that occurs. He's the he's the uh, manager of the entire emergency radio communication system um, for the fire and life safety as well as the sheriff's office. Um, so that will be the, the purpose of having having him lead that project is to make sure that that happens. So is this the first time we're kind of incorporating the school division into this uh, network or what? Well, no, sir. They they have communications mm -hmm. currently. It's just there are it's some there's some dead spots, yeah. and so the idea is how do we address those dead separately. spots? Right. It's managed separately. It's managed separately, is it not? Well, the 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 principals have mm -hmm. have radios. The school resource officers, which are members of the sheriff's office, have radios. Um, th those radios for sure talk to all the other sheriff's office radios. It's just a question of the will they w well no will they talk when they are in certain locations of the building? Yeah, it's not an interoperability issue. It's, it's an issue of like a, a dead, like have a cell area. phone and you're out area. somewhere where you can't communicate in your house or something. You know, so okay. so it's just it's uh, it my, seems my to be a question, smart way of doing my business. My question so. has to do with the fact that we did have excess funding in that impact aid fund how did we allow it to build up to that area without using it this is where i'm coming from or is it just sitting Pension. well they have to well, ask for they have to request it no one thing well yes it's up but to them to request we, it. we've always had a limit of five million dollars in in that fund that's what it was designed to hold and so there was excess there i'm glad you're going to be able to use it but i was just asking was it just been sitting there Yes, ma'am. It's been in that account. Yes. <laughs> so nobody asked for the money, so they didn't right. get to use it. So it's been dirty. How much is in there right now? Zero interest. Five point six. Five point five four. Five point six is what I have written okay. down. Okay. So you got about six hundred thousand over the five. Five point six. Six hundred. Over that goal. Yeah, right. We've okay. we've come over the history, and Dennis can give some history behind it. But you know, we we're very conservative with that fund because we know that if impact aid took a major hit from washington dc we would need that fund and every dime of it um to to kind of backfill our, our budget but we pulled down a few times on it but we know that it's there so this is one of those times that we say hey this was a perfect opportunity to okay. bring a public safety issue. No, i have no problem with it. i'm just curious that it's been sitting there and not been used yeah. well it's been growing I think actually over the years yeah. it's well, not it, just sitting well, that's right not five million dollars sitting but it's uh, been accumulating over the years if i might add just a couple of comments to that the fund does earn interest it, it, the money is invested by the county treasurer and so the fund does earn interest and mm -hmm. the money got in there from a number of sources if you remember some of the folks in this room were around during this period but in 1996 mm -hmm. when the federal government shut down um they withheld our impact aid payments. And so in the middle of the year, we had to cut about $2 million out of our budget. In that same year, you gave the school division an extra $500,000 to bridge the gap too. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened was, then the federal government got over the shutdown, and then the next fiscal year, they released all this money. So we ended up getting about two, two and a half million dollars in one-time payments from them that at the time the county administrator and the division superintendent got together and said, hey, why don't we create a revenue stabilization fund so that if this ever happens again, we got something to fall back on. Now what's happened is over the years, interest has accumulated on that and we've had other overages mm -hmm. and the agreement that we have is that any overages in that fund in, in the impact aid area, uh, area <coughs> go into this fund. So it's accumulated over the years. You did use this fund uh, back, oh gosh, it's been close to eight, ten years now, to put the synthetic turf yep. in mm -hmm. at York High School. Yeah. That was about an $800,000 project, and that brought the fund down. But what's happened is the interest has accumulated, and so it's getting back up. And that's why we feel very comfortable in using these dollars in this fund for this project. And if any other one-time projects come along, it's always a, it's, it's a, it's an avenue to use, and it is one-time money. So we do want to always keep in mind that these dollars are for one-time cost kinds mm -hmm. of things. So it's a, it, and the ultimate purpose of this fund is if in the event there's a shortfall in impact aid, we can program these funds in over a period of years so we don't have to have a $2 million 
shortfall in a given year, we can do this over several years <coughs> to phase in those reductions. Okay. And just for clarification for the public, the impact aid is money received by the county from the federal government because of the impact of federal employees uh, who live within the community. So it's, it's very important. Unfortunately, I harp on this all the time, we never get the right amount. So they cut a short, I think last time you said they had cut a short by $4 million a year. And that's a lot of money. So our, our federal delegation keeps saying that they're trying to get them going, but uh, money's tied everywhere, I guess. Any other questions on this? Okay, great. Thank you. Did you have anything no. you wanted to? Okay. Nope. Okay. Um, moving away from the capital side of the budget, we want to just run quickly through, uh, first on my, from my perspective, a couple just refresher slides about the budget that we proposed to you. Of course, it's $133.4 million. We are not proposing a tax rate increase. Um, our major areas of focus in putting the budget together were to uh, address school funding uh, to the extent possible, to try to uh, recommend an employee compensation increase, and what's proposed in the budget is a 2% increase for county employees, and then finally to fund the necessary increases in program costs and service costs, as well as to uh, continue to fund the, the uh, capital improvements program uh, and the cash that needs to go into that to, to make that program work. Um, the, uh, the new revenue growth that the county will realize, projected growth uh, in FY16 is $950,000 and what's been proposed in the budget is to allocate $361,000 of that growth to the school division, leaving $589,000 on the county side. The, uh, the way that's broken down in the proposed budget is the 361, of course, to the to the uh, school division, 2% increase in compensation for county employees is 750000 We also have an increase in health and dental insurance costs, uh, employer share of that, uh, and then the other various increases uh, associated with departmental increases, the CIP, outside agency uh, requests, and then finally uh, realizing some debt service savings allowed some opportunities to, uh, to fund some of those priorities that uh, particularly the compensation increase. Mm -hmm. um, again, total revenue growth, new revenue growth of $950,000. Here's how it breaks out in terms of the percentages allocated to the various functions across the board. You see educational services, which does include schools and libraries, represents by far the largest percentage of expenditures in the general fund budget. Um, and that is where we where we stand from the county standpoint. Now we realize that uh, that 361,000 is not all that the school division has asked to, to receive from the county, and we've talked about that and um, continue to, to have discussions about that. And Dr. Shander will will mention some of that discussion in his presentation as to how that gap can be uh, can be addressed. We, are there any questions? From, yeah. well, I don't know if you got a question now. It's good yeah, time I've got a question. Mark, go back to this slide here. Okay. The no first tax one. increase before. Okay. Uh, actually, no. I'm sorry. The one, but one after that. One after. Okay. Yeah. We, we, can you just take a minute or two and go back to 2008 when the, uh, the economy went this way and we had the uh, the Great Recession of 2008 uh, time frame? Sort of walk us through. Uh, the, the uh, pay r pay increases, if any, pay raises, if any, and if so, for a given year, what were they, so that our viewing public gets an idea about how long this kind of a raise has been re needed. Okay. You could just, uh, um, yes, I know sir. I didn't give any call this what? afternoon, that, but um, with your incredible knowledge. <laughs> well, fortunately, I... <laughs> My incredible staff prepared a nice chart for me to look at. So. <laughs> Good for you, all of um, you. In uh, FY10, fiscal year 10, uh, there were no uh, compensation increases proposed for county employees. Uh, in FY11, there were no increases proposed. In FY12, there were no increases proposed. In FY13, there were no increases proposed. In FY14, the board chose to approve a 2%. Uh, compensation increase for county employees and then last year in FY15 the board chose to approve a 3% uh, compensation increase for county employees so to date 5% since 
fiscal year 2010. And again, what's proposed this year in my proposal to you is 2%. And that none of those years included any kind of a step increase. Uh, That's correct. Uh, yes, right. sir. Uh, That's right. The, 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 yeah. step, the step system has been suspended since that time. As you know, we have uh, recently, uh, you, you all authorized a contract with a consulting firm to uh, take a, a, a complete look at the county's compensation system to look at how to revamp that pay system. Um, you know, frankly, the current system is as out of whack, and, and it, it wouldn't really make any sense to try to re-implement that at this point in time because it's just so old. And, and what's yeah. the importance of, of this, this step increase concept? The, the well, the the, the 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 purpose of the compensation plan yeah. is to have a an equitable way of compensating employees to ensure that the various classifications of employees relate properly to one another in terms of level of pay and to also provide some incentive for employees to stick with the county uh, because of the, the opportunity for compensation increase based on the classic on the on the pay plan that's that's ultimately adopted so um, and cost of living increase. and and to keep up with cost of living I mean yes yeah, some of the, the the steps in a compensation plan don't necessarily equal the same percentage every year they vary they could vary over the course of four or five years different percentages so in some years they might not keep up with the cost of living but the idea is to keep the, the compensation growth uh, progressing at a reasonable rate so that so that the first year employee uh, and the 10 year employee or five or six year employee doing the same job ought not be paid the same correct after all the experience gained by that five or six or seven year employee. That's correct, right? yes, sir. Yeah. That's right. Um, Mark, you mentioned cost of living. In, uh, I, have we kept up with the cost of living increases? I don't um, think so. I don't think so, no. I don't I'd, think so I'd, at all. In fact, that was, one of the sad, that was one of the sad things. If you just look at inflation during that period from about That's 2008 right. to 2013, we were wait. They just we were they were losing. I mean, the employees That's were right. losing, and uh, and 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 it just kind of go along with what uh, Walt's talking about uh, in the history. Just remember the, the state um, and a, and several of the communities around here. All, what what did they have to live through? They just cut. They were cutting money. They were pulling it out. And what we were doing is fighting, trying to trying to hold up uh, at least a standard here in the county. So that um, and we were we were doing it really. Um, because everybody around, it wasn't just the employees taking a hit. It was the the whole, the whole country okay. were taking a hit, and so it was tough times. Uh, and as you see today, that you know they talk about the jobs increasing and everything, but the, but the pay levels are nowhere near what they were. So we're, it was a kind of a significant change of, of how we are looking and how we're using the money. Uh, so. I know it's it's the employees is very important, and that's why it was a priority for you guys this year. It's been a priority, it's been a priority for ours, uh, for our folks too. And don't we ever forget that five percent we had to deal with uh, that issued the state uh, magically levied on us, thinking that was a good deal for everybody, when unnecessarily true. So anyway, um, Mr. Chair, I got a question. Sure. Uh, Two percent increase for health and dental increase for the employer. What about the employee? Is there also an increase there? It, yes, sir. Two percent is <coughs> the. We, we've tried to minimize that increase for the employee to the absolute extent possible, and so the proposal is a two percent. do we pay? Do our employees pay the same percentage as the school employees pay, as far as their health? No, I mean, there there served? are differences between the two programs in terms of the uh, the amount of contribution by the employee. I would think, just uh, thinking about it, is that they're all county employees, regardless of whether they work for the schools or for the county, it's taxpayers' money. And I would wonder why, to make it simpler and, and make it fairer, that everybody wasn't paying the same percentage. I know you're going to be looking into this, and I, I hope that when both our teams get together, that we can come up with something that is a little bit more equitable as far as the health company, health coverage is concerned. 
I think that would, I think that would be very good. I think it's. I think we're in agreement that it certainly is a topic As for a topic, discussion. Yeah. Of, of that, it uh, should be that a topic that for the supervisors be. for sure because we're there's a significant difference. Yes. Um, and we did make the change last year, last year, I guess, on our plan, and we had a, a much, it was a fairly rich plan, and we, we made those changes to to help uh, the employee and the employer in the whole division. So uh, that was last year, wasn't it? It was last yeah. year, and I think that we, we, look, we look at the, we look up from a different direction, okay? And our employees that, you know, have not received compensation for years that just the got same. pointed out, some of the things that sometimes can retain that employee is a benefit. And so we have done our best to protect some of the benefits that we have, even with the state throwing the VRS at us, that we're finally finishing up this coming year um, that we're getting ready to roll into. But health care, we look at it as we had to make some difficult decisions about changing our plan that more aligns with what the county plan is with Anthem. But I can speak for myself that'd be the last direction I'd want to go to start increasing premium to the employee that hasn't had compensation seen in their paycheck for years because that is not the direction we I would want to go and I wouldn't support that now I do support collaboration between the two but I would think that y'all could find ways to maybe reduce the employee share where we're closer to what we're doing than the other way around because that does create a benefit that benefits many. I don't think so, the board is particularly interested in, in trying to reduce the benefits, which I under, we fully understand. Well, I'm talking about the, the, the If you, if rate. you go through there and you yeah. talk to the employees, you will hear often the idea that they would, in a, in a way, they would rather receive this, that salary-related, you know, uh, issue where they would pay less uh, over the year because that's just that's essentially is a pay raise if you can take that. And, and people that want to get in, uh, uh, you know, or take a job so that they have the insurance or able to pay for that insurance or get the health benefits from that, that's a significant motivation. That's not just in local government. That's the same way in, <coughs> in civilian life, too, so, or outside of the government. So uh, that's an important point. But that's something that the board of supervisors definitely need to think about for, uh, you know, for the coming budget discussions. And if not to this year, we definitely need to look at it for next year. So. Uh, but anyway, do uh, you want to continue? Anything else we can continue on with your presentation? Uh, that that's, it? that's it for me. And now Dr. Sander has some slides okay, that he'd Dr. like to share. Thank you. Yes, I have a few slides this evening. As you know, our school board approved their budget last night. Our staff actually ran the copies um, of the budget over to Mr. Carter this morning. And I wanted to share a few slides tonight as a review uh, of our budget. I'll just take just a few minutes. Um, the numbers in our total operating budget, as you can see, were just under $130 million. Uh, we were able to decrease this number by a little over $600,000. Um, we're also projecting an enrollment, as, as was stated earlier this evening, of an increase of 250 students. Um, there's obviously many items in our budget. Um, there are some that are not as significant in terms of overall dollars. Uh, but I wanted to remind the community and, and all board members this evening of our three main priorities, which, again, are staff compensation, transportation, and um, technology. So if you look at this next slide, just by the numbers, um, for compensation, this slide indicates the cost breakdown for licensed and non-licensed staff members. Our total there for um, compensation is $1.54 million. And then the next slide, this slide indicates the cost to restore a step for all eligible staff members who have lost five steps. Yeah, that is your, that's your, mm -hmm. and the your total, standard, okay. Correct. And, and the total cost for that is, is 908000 And then again, as you know, you've, you've seen this slide before, this is our transportation slide. Again, we plan to utilize funds to replace buses over the next several years in order to get us on, get us back on track for our normal replacement cycle. So the cost of uh, replacing four buses is, is 400000 with vehicle, vehicle and parts, I'm sorry, vehicle parts and supplies at 100000 Now we've set up a fund for that, for that right? Well, so that, we that's one of the proposals that I made to you all is okay. that uh, instead of solely the technology fund at the end of the year as an opportunity to, to place uh, carryover funds in, that also a transportation or bus replacement right. fund be set up so that the school board would have the opportunity to request that that funding go into either or both of those 
those uh, accounts. Well, yeah, it does. It's a great thing. It gives visibility to that issue, which is which is a significant issue. Buying buses are, are you know, they're pricey. Yeah, buying, yeah they're pricey. <laughs> <laughs> they <leave. laughs> So the next one, looking at priority three again, is technology. You know, technology supports major classroom tools in our school division, such as Aspen, Benchmark, and SOL testing. We need to address the life expectancy of our storage systems and servers. Um, the cost uh, for this will partially replace our storage units and servers and other related equipment. And then uh, I believe this is my last slide. So in summary, you can see the county contribution requ um, increase request is a little over a million dollars. The county administrator has recommended 361,000, and we're uh, we have a, a budget gap of a, a little over 671,000 dollars. So I could so we could certainly open it up to any questions or comments. So what's uh, what's the okay? I'm sorry. Go ahead, George. On your uh, technology piece, I know the. We were briefed earlier this week on the dark fiber that the uh, county's using. Uh, is our schools looking at using into that uh, tapping into the dark fiber to reduce your overall costs for uh, uh, bandwidth? Yeah, I'm going to have to ask Dr. James to speak on that. Is that a, we don't know. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have any information about that this evening, but okay. we can certainly get that information okay. to you. All right. Thank you. Sorry for throwing you under the bus <laughs> there, Dr. James. <laughs> you threw him under the bus. <laughs> I did. I, I have a question, though, George. It's, it's right a brand now. new bus. But, yeah. but I, have, I have a question that's related to that because it's important. Uh, there's, because of new technology and things are advancing, and George, probably you've done a little more research on this, but the black fiber is essentially it's a closed loop within it's a fiber within the school system itself in other words it's the it, county or just sits there in other words we're not buying cox or any other fiber we're buying it's just our fiber laying there right fiber robin network that we're leasing or it, buying it, right it's actually it's a, it, what's what's going on with the county side is a private entity okay. is installing dark fiber and, and the dark means it's not being used right once somebody leases a strand or multi strands then it is illuminated <laughs> this is the terminology that they use it's illuminated and there are there are computer gizmos attached to either end um, which allows the data to flow through that that fiber optic cable so what the county discovered <coughs> is that by virtue of this private contractor putting in the the, the uh, cable and then allowing it to be leased and the county installing the gizmos on either end, we can actually save not a great amount of money, but some money in terms of the of the funds that were being used used to lease that bandwidth from the you know your traditional providers. providers that you know of, um, and the bandwidth capability increases by a hundred times. So it was particularly advantageous to get the. The library on that mm -hmm. uh, because of the increased use of the Wi-Fi within the library so that the bandwidth went from 10 whatever it is to 100 whatever it is um, and that substantially increased the capability of people to use those devices within the library so there are various other county buildings that are now interconnected by virtue of this private contractor taking the initiative to put this cable in the ground and then the county arranging for the the, the connections on either end um, and there probably are some opportunities for the school division to eventually do that as more and more of that cable is laid in strategic locations is a um, are you guys uh, in the school system taking advantage of cloud technology in, your, um, in reducing the cost or is this is a question we should maybe yeah, give I would us. have to. Where is Doug Mead when we yeah. need him? <laughs> He's our IT. Yeah. I would have to, yeah, get our IT, IT folks who, would, who can answer that question for you. It just reduces uh, the reliance on, uh, you know, on, on standalone systems. And um, so I think combining all the new technology, there are some, some big savings um, uh, that, that I'm seeing in local governments through the um, Virginia Association of Counties and through the Virginia Planning District Commissions and the meetings and stuff like that. You're seeing more and more of uh, these industries popping up, uh, big ones in North Carolina uh, that are actually uh, serving uh, uh, companies or, or governments here in Virginia because of the way they handle that technology and it helps reduce the costs. And I know technology costs have been a huge issue because of the cycling are you still using a six-year cycle 
uh, to renew the schools or are you off to that I, now? Well, I believe we're off that cycle. I think okay. that's part of the reason for the for our request, yes. Everything I read about the cloud, though, there's still security issues associated yes. with that. So uh, I'd go slow or do certain I'd go forward deliberately. Our tech gurus would, would certainly vet yeah. all of that. I would not be the one doing that. <laughs> I have a question, Chair, if I can sure, ask you. On, the first, on your first slide, projected increase in enrollment is 250 uh, students. Uh, Annually, about how accurate are we with respect to projected enrollments? Anybody know? I think they mentioned earlier that Mr. Cross. Tim, <laughs> Tim, you're Tim, Tim is one. very accurate. Tim I will is, speak for. I, Tim uh, is, I will say kudos to. We Tim. have good years and we have bad years. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a fairly Overall, large, Tim, you've done well. Large that large actually, they're, what they're what they're calling an increase. That's an increase over the projection for this past <coughs> year. Uh, the actual increase. Uh, is uh, about 150 yeah. uh, students, as I recall. So why, why do we have 250 here? Because we're over 100. Because when, what they're calling an increase, they're comparing it to what we had projected oh. for this past September. But this, which was, this fiscal year. For this, for this past September, yeah. right, the current fiscal year, yeah. which was, I believe, 12 four twenty, and it actually came in at 12 five thirty, something like that. Uh, so the, the actual increase September to September would be about 150. I guess uh, brief, so that's the less. Reason, reason for my question is <clears throat> just was wondering um, what impact on the $129 million does 250 or 150 or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know. yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, I, I understand your question. Um, what, what Mr. Cross was explaining is our budget for a fiscal year 15 was based on 12,420 students. Now, when we budget for fiscal year 16, we're budgeting for 12,670 students. Mm -hmm. That's the 250 student difference. So to get to your point, Mr. Zaremba, is that now we want to capture all of that additional state revenue that comes with those additional 250 students. So when we build the, the FY16 budget, we capture all of those 250. Now, as Mr. Cross pointed out, we do have some of those students here this year. Okay, we bud budgeted for 12420. We're we're hovering around 12500 to 12550. Now we will get that additional state revenue this year for it, but it's not really included in our budget right yet. So, and to keep the budgets, I guess you might say, equal from year to year, we show the total amount of enrollment increase and show the total amount of revenue coming. That's the fair way to do it because then you're seeing the full impact of the revenue from the state, which was reflected in those slides up there. Thank you. Uh, but but <coughs> if, if, in fact, at the end of the year you do not have that increase, do you pay it back to the state? Uh, no, they don't pay us for those students if we don't what? have that. We have had years where the budget, uh, enroll, budget enrollment was X amount, but it came in less than that. So the state pays us per ADM. It's what they call the March 31 ADM. If our March 31 ADM count is below the projection, the state does not pay us for those students. So, and that's, a, that's why we watch this very closely. I, I can tell you the best example of that is at the beginning of the year. If our enrollment <coughs> in the first 10 days of school is looking like it's not going to meet our enrollment projection, we don't put all those teachers out in the schools. We hold back teachers because we want to make sure we've got the funding to cover okay. the cost that we have. Okay. And the vice versa that happens this year where we had more enrollment than was projected, so we were able to hire a few additional teachers. Okay, great. Any, okay, any other questions on this? Okay, more, anything else? That concludes our presentations. We'd be happy to well, answer let's, any questions. Let's, we're we're, we're yeah. going to go around. Hang on a second. So, Victor, well, you got anything I have before a question we go? On this. Oh, on this? Okay, no, sure. Sorry. Go ahead. The obvious question is uh, the shortfall. Well, you talking I, about the gap. Yeah. What the school board will do um, once you, as a board, make a decision. I know there's been discussion between uh, Mr. Carter and Dr. Shandor, but we would task our superintendent with bringing us options um, once we have to go back and work with a gap. And But I can't s sit here today and tell you what those options would be. So uh, but I know so there's been or, or we, we've had, yes, we've had, we've had discussions. <clears throat> we've talked about, again, 
you know, last time they were soft numbers, so to speak, and you know, now we have the numbers. So we've had some preliminary discussions. Our teams have met. Um, so we, we have some thoughts and ideas on that and strategies to close that gap. We're not prepared to present them tonight. We're going to meet after spring break and, and further um, review our options. Would that be fair? Yes. Good. Thank you. Okay. Do you have anything else you want to add to that? Okay, good. Well, you want to just go around the room and any comments or anything? Robbie? I don't think so. This okay, time. Yours? I just Gage. appreciate the opportunity to, to meet together again and think things are working out well. Super. Don? No, same with me. I appreciate you guys coming. Thank you. Well, just uh, uh, wondering whether or not the, the, the county administrator and the superintendent think we have another joint session before we uh, uh, put it to bed, or any idea about that? Whether I, is it, again premature to? Do, I don't believe we will we need okay. to do that. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I think at this point in time, it's a matter of our teams getting together yeah. and, and talking about how that gap can be uh, can be addressed and. No, I think it's been very, very uh, beneficial. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, Barbara? No, I just thank you for the opportunity of uh, sitting down and discussing the issues that we face. I still plug in. This is, we're all about kids, so we've got to do what we need to do for kids. Okay. Ms. Noel? I thank you all for joining us tonight. I think it's 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 been good. We've had what is our second meeting? Third. Or our third meeting. All good things come in threes, and I, I think we've 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 talked about a lot of issues, and I, I think a lot of things are clearer. So thank you for all your assistance. I would just like to thank you all too, and I would also like to commend Mr. Carter and Dr. Shandor for their hard work and their staff hard work because I think this has been a, a very pleasant budget season and I'm, I'm very pleased Good. All right. collaboration I mean I'll just leave it with that because I think we've seen the benefit of um, of what the two staffs working together can do and what it can bring in a positive note um, us working together asking the right questions um, and understanding what both facing as boards we do public education in York County and y'all deal with a lot of different things in the county. <laughs> so just having that collaborative um, relationship is, is beneficial to all. And I think the citizens, the comments I've heard from people is y'all are talking, y'all are communicating, and you're working forward to move York County forward. That's what it's all about. So thanks again. If there's a need for another joint meeting, by golly, give us a call. If it's a matter of just meeting with counterparts as we move forward, um, don't hesitate to give us a call or email. Yeah, and uh, I really wanted to um, <clears throat> they um, foot stomped uh, the, the the point about the staffs working together. It's uh, mm -hmm. you know that's where the, the nuts and bolts get <coughs> worked out, and, and they bring it up to us. And of course, we we look at the bigger picture and and, and put in the policy piece to it. But uh, it's really the staffs have been working together, and it's been really refreshing to see and hear the the uh, the interchange that has taken place, and, and we're seeing the benefits of that. And this uh, really is great, and and then the fact that we've met three times, three <laughs> times, okay, is uh, is uh, it's pretty pretty amazing. I mean, we haven't done that uh, ever that that I can recall, and so this time has been uh, in a deliberate effort on everybody's part to get together, and and that communication is uh, very healthy, and it's. Uh, um, helps us do what we're supposed to be doing, taking care of our students, taking care of our public, and uh, and making good decisions. And having some common goals right. between the two boards. Right. And it's easy to understand those now. So anyway, I appreciate that. And with that, I will uh, end the session. And, and I'll adjourn our school board um, meeting. And okay, great. Thank you. Here's, you have to adjourn your meeting Friday. Friday.
Why are you doing all the way down there? Well, they split me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark. Um, well, Mr. Chairman, tr traditionally after the budget is released, there is a fairly brief work session where the board identifies the topics that you would like us to present in greater detail at future work sessions. So that's where we are tonight with our request to you for you to identify the topics that you would like us to prepare additional information on and bring back to you at one or more of those work sessions that are on the tentative calendar. Uh, so it could be we can throw the, out like the CIP, CIP right? okay, the contributions to, to, to groups and that. agencies, those kinds of things, any any of those kinds of things. And what was that, the what? Well, you know, your contributions that would be made to organizations and that's right. Type of organizations, right. okay. Um, traditionally, that's been one of the topics for a work session as well as the CIP. Right. I'd any, like to see that more. Okay. That would be that we need to discuss that. Okay. CIP is the one that I'm most interested in. I think we, it's time that we really look at what we have to do and start planning better about how we can afford to, to pay for what has to be done. And so I think that that's really on my top of my list. Okay. This is for a work session? Is for a future work session dealing with this budget cycle. So we have to get these dealing within with this the budget next. Cycle. So these are the things that, that – that, you know, like uh, in the past where we had to deal with recycling or we deal with garbage or it could be any any subject that you think that the staff needs to bring to us to address the budget items that Mark presented in his budget. Do you us. want that like tonight or? Well, I, I think that the, the CIP and the contributions to groups well, and organizations, would, I mean, that, yeah. that could fill one work session. So, right. I mean, that gives us enough to work on for your next I've got one. I, I know you've worked hard with the departments not too much with this budget, but what about the constitutional officers? Is there any type of uh, shortages or needs that uh, aren't articulated in this budget that we need to get them to talk about? <clears throat> um, what they request, you know? I got a call from Sheriff uh, Diggs today that and then we want to play telephone did. tag, and we haven't talked. We just a series. Of somebody thinking if we all got it, there must be something. It's the issue. It's raise. the issue on, on on the pay raise differential between the uh, what the schools have planned for their employees um, and what we've planned for our employees. Mm -hmm. So there's a, about a one and a half percent right, difference. So I think it's a good right. subject to bring up. Uh, there's two subjects related to that. One we mentioned tonight was the comp the um, salary related costs uh, issue. There's about an $1,800 difference between what the school uh, pay saves their employees and what than what we do. So right. um, and so that's there's a big that's a huge difference. And because of the step increase? Uh, no, 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 because no, of the, the way the health, health insurance health is computed. Insurance. Well, the, the health insurance. Health so, insurance uh, is not so in talking, <clears throat> I've talked to Danny a little bit about that, and um, you know, the the employees are again keeping in mind each each employee is going to be a little different where their focus is, mm -hmm. but if their focus is it particularly in the health insurance side of it, uh, the eighteen hundred dollars is a huge difference per year that uh, our <clears throat> our employees pay that the school employees do not pay so uh, that's something uh, closing that gap I think is going to be kind of a, a sensitive issue that we need to look at that's one of the reasons uh, you know, why I, I, I talked, um, talked about having you know both staffs working together and come up with a common pay plan because actually it's paid for by the taxpayers whether it be the county employees well, and or the others and it should be the same well not a pay plan but the medical you know, I mean, the medical. medical. Well, well the compensation. I mean, the medical. medical well, the thing medical would insurance. be, would, the, would the, the question to us would be that we would have to bring ours up. Okay, I don't see them bring. In fact, Mark made it very clear that they're not going to bring it down. They're not even interested in doing that. And and I don't. I sort of. Would, I be honest with you. I would agree with them on that because the sensitivity, what we have cut over the years, has been to close that gap. Mm -hmm. of what the school wasn't getting in terms from state money and that's so riding on the back of the employees is an important uh, is an important point now you know if we want to we I'm not saying you know we shouldn't look at it but I guarantee you you're gonna you're, you're gonna get ready well, for a, a, a real you know a real round what's driving the uh, what's driving the differential 
Well, they, they have a different rate structure and a different philosophy as far as the percentage of the, the uh, health insurance cost right. that the employer pays versus the employee, and, and there, is, there, there are differences between our two programs. It's, I mean, I will say this, it's not going to be a quick fix kind of a thing. Right. It, it's, it's something expensive. that will... this budget. That, right. It, it, it is a longer-term kind of a discussion issue. Um, it, it's something that, that I think that the, the, the team that we are proposing to set up to talk about the health insurance issue in general, and that would be one of the subjects. Obviously, the reserve is one of the other subjects that they'll most immediately look at. But um, And also the step increase. In other words, if that's going to be, um, you know, the goal for next year's budget, I think that we ought to have some fairly early uh, work sessions where we can, first of all, begin to understand, you know, going back to, to a model that, that we had to give up, what, eight years ago or whatever number of years ago, uh, but if our intent is to reinstitute the, the step increase, I think we need to start off where uh, let's make things sure we understand the, the concept and how we intend to go forward if we want to put something in place by next year's budget, yeah. which is, the, I think, the goal. Well, the, right. The consultant will be engaged here in another, yeah. I guess, month or so. Um, I think the work session? The or? Well, no. The, the consultant will start their work. Okay. Um, and it's a... I think it's a six-month process for them to do all that they need to do. Right. So, uh, yes, latter latter part of this year, there would be an opportunity to talk with the board right. about findings. That's and obviously an issue. But again, that's not this. I have another yeah, issue. Go let's ahead, let's let, I'll get down here. Uh, I talked to Mark earlier today about this same thing, and Mark said that we could possibly, without hurting ourselves, we could possibly give them, give our our. Uh, a, a raise of two and a half percent instead of the two percent, and and I would suggest that we do that. Well, and that would be a great subject that for our for work session. That's work session. That we that's do that fine. during this budget cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can. I, I agree. That's if we can. If we can do it, I agree with you. I think that's something Mark, we've been Mark talking about. Mark says we with. can do it. Well, let's. Well, well, Mark isn't who. Let's see where it comes from. This Mark. This yeah. mark. Not this mark. No. Okay. I'm saying, what, what's this mark? Our, our mark. mark. Okay. Our mark. Mr. Carter. Mr. Well, they Carter. have last names. Yeah. He's okay. ours, not the other. Got to keep up, Walt. I was getting excited about. <laughs> I said. <laughs> but I, but I think that's something that any, we possibly uh, any other, can do. It. Any other subjects right now? I mean, just just that we don't have to. You know, if we if we got more subjects later on, you think of something, yeah, put it in there because we have uh, we have a lot of a lot of we got members we got. We got Tuesdays and Thursdays to use if we need them for the budget. Right, right. Okay. And uh, May, uh, the May uh, the budget May. approval date is the end game. May what? May fifth. May fifth. The um, the next work session would be the April seventh meeting. Okay. Um, I think yes, we can we probably get together the CIP and contributions for yes. that. Okay. <coughs> uh, and then you have tentatively scheduled the fourteenth, the twenty eighth, and the thirtieth. Um, you know, ideally, we would not need all of those dates, no, I don't but, think so. but um, it they, they're, like it they're tentatively on the calendar. So, well, I'll be, I'm going to be particularly interested if because you're going to be working with uh, Dr. Sandor, Sandor, I'm saying that right, Sandor. and with Victor. Okay, you're going to work with him to figure <laughs> out the gap, right? Well, how, to close it, that, how that gap's going to get closed? Right. It it it's it's really. Or there you go. you know, it, 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 it's really on their, um, you know, they're, they're going to have to come up with some proposals as to how they, how they deal with that gap, um, given the amount of money that's proposed to come from the county. And I think he's got some preliminary ideas about how he would, how he would propose that to the school board. So yeah, however he does it, that, that's their business, I, um, I would think. But but we'll be, we'll, well be talking we about know, that. And, and then obviously that. you all want to know how that's yeah. going yep. to be accomplished. Sure. Because we're talking less than, or right at about half a percent of their budget. It's half half of one percent, excuse me. So it's just it's not a that's not significant a whole lot. amount. No. So. I, I think the key thing that they were hoping to achieve tonight, and I think you all you all gave that to them was some was a, a basic assurance that the three hundred sixty one thousand dollars was a figure that they could pretty much rely on in terms of a contribution coming from the county. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean that gives them a, a baseline to work with. If you had said no, it's going to be a hundred thousand instead. Then that widens the gap and makes it more difficult. But um, I think they were looking for that assurance. I think you all gave that to them. 
uh, in, in your discussion. So I, I think that important. number, uh, the number is important. And I, I go back to what Walt said last year. I just remember that because we were, we always like to compare ourselves with James City County. And James City County is, is has more space to grow, and they've been they've been doing things. They got uh, they've been generating more and more revenue. And I, to me, what it comes down to is sort of determining how wealthy, if you will, or how successful a community is. And and again, it's all a function of of a mix of businesses and and activities like that. And um, and if you look at James City <coughs> County. It, you know, yeah. they were getting more money because they were being very successful in their business generation, right. and it was working out. So the community was considered growth like that was wealth, and, and so they had more money. Your county is a successful county, but we're not generating that kind, of, that kind of revenue. And as a result, we don't have that much revenue being excess being generated. So the 300, the 300,000, or the, actually, I think when you got through working with the numbers, about 900,000 altogether, but it was revenue uh, growth, right? It, it shows that we're doing what we can with the money that we generate. If people want to do something that generates more revenue in the in the county, the businesses, they're more than welcome to. We'll, we'll help them out some way or another. Well, here's so, the irony, and, and since you brought up our, our neighbor, which of course we were very close to James City County and the city of Williamsburg. And, for nothing else than the historic uh, aspect of the three uh, municipalities. <coughs> but here's the irony. Uh, you know, they, according to their past administrator, their budget, ours is $133 million, $134 million. Theirs is $174 million. Mm -hmm. $40 million difference, okay? Population relatively the same. Profile demographics relatively the same, Pop student population relatively the same. And yet this year, the county administrator comes to their board saying, we got to raise the tax rate by eight cents. We're, I mean, yeah. is that ironic or what? Because, well, it, well, and because the, the study's out of control. Why, why, they, the why they said they had to do it. No, it would do it because was, of the stormwater. Oh, well. And, and if you, more, and one of the more, things I thought was important in that is that if you look at our stormwater uh, issues and how we address it, it's already incorporated in our budget. Mm -hmm. They're already in there. I mean, you just, all you got to do is open up the budget, and you we've can see it. how we've been doing it for years and the things we put on, like stormwater. I mean, not just the stormwater, but the sewer systems, you know, like up there in yeah. Queens we've Lake. Well, enterprise fund. Yeah, and, is, and, and that's millions. In fact, that one up there is almost all at $19, $20 million project. And those things get credited towards our TMDL and our future costs. So uh, where a lot of these local governments uh, that are our neighbors uh, are real concerned. Um, yeah, I remember last year Chesapeake set aside almost $11 million to be able to get ready to – just to get ready to address their stormwater issues. Yet we – Yet we are continuing to meet all our, our TMDL and stormwater issues in our budget. So the planning, how you, how you budget it and how you plan for it can really have a rippling effect later on in the future. And I think we've been fairly successful at that. So. And if, you're, if your comments are accurate, what you're saying, we have an incredible staff that uh, uh, budget staff certainly manager. gets the job done. That's where the work is done. Makes the county administrator look good. The county administrator makes the board look really good. Or, and even the county the county attorney. We're very pleased to hear that. We're all good. Okay. Uh -huh. okay um, so, you got any other ideas? You can either pass uh, them on now or bring them to us later. But we got you enough going yes, for sir. a couple of meetings enough. now. Yes, sir. Um, is he got anything else for us? No, sir. Okay. What I'll do is go around the room for comments. You got anything? No. Don? No. Oh. No. No. Um, see if we have something I needed to pass on. Uh, we got that American Museum thing. Are you guys going to that? What? Is that, is that? Oh, the, the revolutionary. American, it's kind of like the interim. Right. I don't, interim. I don't several know. dates in April, I think, right? Yes, yeah. So I just want to make sure that was up, up there. Up there. And uh, okay. I so see. other than that, uh, now we're going to recess to April seventh. We're going to adjourn this adjourn. meeting to April three. That's April this three. Friday, and I think it's at eight thirty. Oh yeah, that's for the. Uh, yeah. that's okay, the next meeting. Uh, me, next meeting deals with the uh, interviews that we have for the candidates. Oh, yeah. We have five candidates, and they'll be. We're going through the interviews. It's a whole day yeah. operation. It's uh, basically.
quickly you'll with this go through that process. Be, you'll be in, of course, the admin building at uh, right. uh, on Ballard Street, right. uh, 224 Ballard Street. But you're going to go for the public's information immediately into a closed, closed meeting, session, and you'll so, be in closed right. meeting all day. All day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so as we do the interviews, and uh, <coughs> out of that, we will do, make a determination whether you know how quickly we'll have either have a, um, a uh, county administrator. Or we have to bring them back for another round of interviews or something. So we'll, that's to be determined. So that you, you need a motion to adjourn to so Friday, moved. April 23 at 8.30 a.m. at, at uh, the County Admin Building. Friday, April 23. April 3. Not April 23. 3. April, so 3. April 3. April 3. April 23. Okay, so <laughs> Sheila, Sheila's made the motion made the based motion on what he, what uh, Mr. Barnett said. Okay. And uh, I don't know, we, yeah, I guess we've got a motion on the motion, motion made by Mrs. Knoll is to adjourn the meeting to 8.30 a.m. Friday, April 3rd, 2015, in the County Administration Office at 224 Ballard let me, Street. Let me a quick meeting. question. Is it, is it at 8.30 or 8? I, th I believe because you. Because we added extra 15 minutes. 8.30, I thought. I th my recollection is that the board had, had said 8.30, and that was the schedule that Mr. Banzer Okay, we're going with 8.30. 8.30. At 8.30. 30. Okay, you're good. Yeah, okay. Good. Roll call. Closed meeting. Well, you you will open as a meeting because you have to do that, and then you'll have a motion to go into closed meeting for purposes of consideration. Okay, we get. Let's finish this motion. We finish with the motion. Okay, got it. Mrs. Knoll. Yes. Mr. Wiggins. Yes. Mr. Rishak. Yes. Mr. Zaremba. Yes. Mr. Shepard. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, good.